Next, I have the honor to introduce Mr. Peter Lacey. Um, Mr. Peter is the managing director and partner in Accenture's strategy business. He leads both strategy practices and sustainability services in Asia Pacific. He worked for 15 years with CEOs and the top management of leading global companies, the United Nations, European Union, and the national governments on strategy and sustainability issues. Peter writes and speaks on strategy sustainability regularly and has appeared in the last 12 months in publications such as the Financial Times, Business Weeks, etc. He has three times led the world's largest study on CEO attitude to sustainability for the United Nations, conducted every three years in 2007, 10, and 13 and was a founding signatory and organizer of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education for Ban Ki-moon. Peter is an alumnus of the INSEAD International Executive Program, the University of Cambridge Business and Environment Programs, Oxford University's Business Economics Program, and the University of Nottingham. In 2010, Peter was voted as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. He is leading advisor to WEF's Tomorrow Consumers Initiative and chair its Circular Economy Innovation Task Force. Peter's topic today is circular economy, how to shift the value creation through sustainability. Let's join me to welcome Peter on the stage to give us a speech. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, indeed. I think uh, my introduction might be longer than my speech, but thank you, that was very kind. Um, so. Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. One of the, the, the advantages uh, this morning for me is that I live three minutes away from here, uh, which is the first time I can ever remember walking literally to the conference. So thank you for uh, arranging the conference venue around my apartment. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It looks like you have a great agenda. What I want to talk about is the circular economy. And in particular, what I want to talk about is the increasing ways in which companies are looking around the world at the circular economy, not just as a way to drive sustainability benefits and impact, but as the title suggests, how they're turning circular principles into competitive advantage. Let me first tell you a little bit uh, about Accenture. Some of you will be familiar with Accenture, some of you may not. Uh, the world's largest consulting and technology business now, more than 300,000 people, $50 billion business, um, operating right around the world across sectors. And the work that we do tends to be in the four main areas of Accenture strategy, uh, Accenture digital, Accenture technology, and Accenture operations. China has been a major part of our business now going back 25 years. We have more than 10,000 people here in China and we work with many particularly of the largest state-owned enterprises. So we're relatively unusual for a foreign consulting and technology firm because actually we regard ourselves as being very much Chinese and 80% uh, of our clients are Chinese, which is reasonably uh, differentiated with offices uh, right across China. I think the, 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 the important point to make is that we work with most of the world's leading companies in terms of helping them shape their strategies, helping them shape their approach to delivering technology. 
And I think that's important when I come on to talk about the circular economy because I think the kind of shifts that we're starting to see but also the kind of shifts that are required require uh, changes right across the board in terms of the way that we think about business models, value chains uh, and capabilities within businesses. I uh, lead two businesses for Accenture. I live here in Shanghai and have now for, uh, for a number of years. Uh, I lead two businesses. I lead our strategy practice, our main strategy practice, so the work that we do on growth, mergers and acquisitions, innovation, these kinds of things uh, right across the region. But also, seven years ago, I founded our sustainability practice, and it's one of the five themes that our chief executive believes uh, is at the heart of the way that we see competitiveness for companies. If you look at companies that want to be competitive, that want to be high performers, that want to be top quartile performers uh, right across the board over the next 10 years, we think that sustainability, not just as an obligation, not just as a responsible business practice, but as a core component and dynamic of their competitiveness uh, and the competitiveness of economies as a whole, we believe that this is going to be a crucial constituent part. And so it's very much about looking at sustainability in its own right as an end in itself, but also as a business lens for innovation, a business lens for value creation. So let me sum up what I'm going to tell you in the next 20 minutes in a slide. I think at the heart of the work that we're doing with clients and the work that I'm doing with clients around the world on the circular economy is the idea of how we can go about growing and creating value as businesses in a world of finite resources and in a world where we see increasing scarcity of natural resources, whether that's energy, whether or not that's metals, minerals, water, we see pressures around the world as a result of increasing consumption, but also increasingly we're finding it more and more difficult to extract at volumes that we need uh, the kind of raw materials that have traditionally powered our global economic growth. And so the real goal of the circular economy, and this is something, it's interesting, I was, the other day I was with Li Keqiang uh, in Tianjin, and one of the things that I've noticed more and more in China, what's not new to China, China's been pursuing the circular economy now since 2006, but I've noticed more and more that the circular economy is becoming part of the way that Li Keqiang and the Chinese leadership describe their goals for creating more balanced growth. And so it's becoming more of a feature here. The goal of the circular economy being very, very simple at its heart. Unfortunately, very simple things can often be extremely complicated to deliver, but at the heart, it's very, very simple. It's the idea of moving from linear value chains to circular value chains. It's the idea from moving from a society that over the last 200 years has done very well in terms of economic development with a model that has been traditionally about take, make, waste, to actually looking at how we keep the value of materials in a circular loop uh, and actually make sure that we really power the economy with a circular set of models. One of the things that I want to get across is that often when we hear people talk about the circular economy, we hear them talk about the fact that this will cost more, that this adds unnecessary costs and potentially makes companies uncompetitive. And of course it's important to be very realistic that there are costs in transition, there are costs associated with any shift in technology paradigm, but what I want to talk about today is the fact that it, over the last 18 months as we've looked around the world to try and source case studies of companies 
that are managing this transition effectively, uh, what we see is that they are able to decouple their growth models from natural resource use and environmental impact while, interestingly, creating additional customer or consumer value and in certain cases, creating what we would genuinely call a strategist with our strategy hats on, competitive advantage, by disrupting their industries and disrupting the traditional models in their sectors. So that's really the heart of what I'm going to talk about. What I also want to get across is actually that this is an extremely practical set of business model shifts that companies can pursue. So one of the things over the last uh, year, and the, one of the reasons that this is extremely present and topical uh, is I just finished the manuscript on my book on literally this weekend. It had to go to the publishers this weekend, which is on the circular economy. And over that 12, 18-month period, uh, what we've discovered is that essentially when you look across these 100 and 150 companies, there are five common business models for the companies that are turning this into competitive advantage. Um, and as a sort of, I guess, a, uh, a sneak preview of the book, which won't be out until the middle of next year because the publishing cycles seem to be totally out of sync with the real world or the business world. Uh, but uh, but I, I want to talk about those five business models. I know there's a number of companies in the room, uh, and I think these are very practical ways and questions that you can ask yourself about how to turn this to an advantage for your business. So... Very kindly, uh, Mr. Liu in his introduction mentioned uh, that I've done a lot of work with, um, with Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon and the UN. One of the most interesting findings for me in the most recent of the CEO studies that Mr. Liu mentioned in 2013 was that for the first time we... Well, so the, the, background to the, concept, the background context for you is that this is the largest global study of, of chief executives on sustainability. It's something we've run now for the UN, as Mr. Liu mentioned, for nearly a decade. We do it every three years. Um, the most recent one in 2013 was launched at the UN General Assembly uh, meeting in last September. Uh, and it was 1,000 CEOs. Um, and it was uh, 25 sectors and, from memory, 100 countries. So it's very, it's very much around the world. We had about 50 CEOs respond here in China. So statistically significant, you know, about the right balance that you should have in a global study from, from China. Most of them um, private enterprises, large private enterprises, or state-owned enterprises. And for the first time, we asked them, do you in the next five years, plan to deploy circular economy business models. Now, we don't have the comparative data, so I can't tell you what they would have said in 2010 or 2007. My gut feel, having served a lot of clients here for that period of time, is that, that there would have been some understanding of circular economy, but I would say that it would have been relatively low. But if you look at this chart, what's very interesting is that you have the global average. So either when asked are they going to deploy these models, 30% um, agree that they will, 5% uh, strongly agree. So 35% strongly agree or agree. In Asia, that goes up to 55% strongly agree or agree. But in China, it goes up to 86%, which is really quite an interesting finding for me. And I think partly it's driven by this set of policies and the policy shift that we're seeing from uh, Li Keqiang and, and Xi and, and others at the very top um, and Sasak and so on. But I found that very interesting because still I don't see enough companies in China thinking through real business models that can actually scale and move quickly to capture not just the domestic advantage but the global advantage. So I just wanted to show you that because I think what that shows to me is um, it may be still early in terms of execution, but this is clearly on the minds of business leaders. The circular economy is on the minds of business leaders uh, across China. So let's get into the issue. What's really the challenge here? Well, what we know from the last well, really the last 250 years, to be perfectly honest. But certainly what we know from the last 30 to 40 years is that if you look at plotting resource use, natural resource use, energy, materials, minerals, water, 
uh, you know, forestry, uh, ocean resources, etc. If you map that against economic development, what you find is that there is a very tightly linked relationship um, over the last 50 years and that we know that if we project that forward to uh, 2030 alone, which now doesn't seem very far away at all, that there'll be another 2.5 billion additional consumers. So we know that there's a link, a very clear link. We also know that competition for access and supply of those natural resources is becoming much more fierce uh, than it's ever been. But this is the real insight for me. If you want to understand the setup and why this matters more than it's mattered in the past, in 2000, we saw, and I'm not sure enough people have absorbed this, but in the year 2000, we saw a fundamental shift in the nature of the resource-driven uh, economic development of the last 50 to 100 years, possibly 250 years. So... Before 2000, if you take, for example, 1975 through to 2000, for every 1% increase in growth, actually, the supply of natural resources dropped by 0.5%, because we were getting much better around the world at finding and extracting natural resources technology advances, engineering, science. So actually what we saw was that as we kept growing, resources became cheaper and more available, right, right up until 2000. From 2000 until 2013, for a number of important structural reasons, one of them being China, very much being China, in terms of its growth since 1978, really starting to move global markets. And you've heard about the resource super cycle that China has, has driven. What we saw was that that relationship totally reversed. So we now see that for every 1% of growth in GDP since 2000, the commodity price index rose by 1.9%. So as we're growing, it's getting more expensive and more difficult to access the resources that we know we need. So we know that our linear models of production and consumption are under significant stress. And we know that there is real money at stake here, not just in terms of the rising prices, but the volatility. The volatility is as, as difficult to manage for business as the actual shift over long periods of time because it's unpredictable and it makes it extremely difficult for you to be able to invest for the future. So this is a really important point. We've seen a shift in 2000. Our research, and if you go back to the slide before and you look at 2.5 billion consumers entering the market by 2030, it would be very brave or foolish to assume that this is not going to continue. We don't see any technology or science or innovation that we currently see on the horizon in that time frame that is likely to change that direction of travel. So that's the setup. The, um, th the way that that plays out is that we're seeing a parallel growth in the cost of extracting different resources um, and we're seeing that increasingly we're coming up against physical limitations to even extract what we consider to be existing reserves. So what you see here is that there are significant reserves in things like black coal or oil, but there are real questions as to whether or not we can economically viably extract many of those, uh, many of those commodities. My view, and Accenture's view, is that the shift from linear to circular will be driven by innovations in business models on the one hand, and innovations in technology. One of the things that I see as being extremely hopeful is the parallel revolution taking place in digital technologies. And when you look at the extraordinary power of things like mobile technology, uh, the Internet of Things, 
the way that we're now able to think about attaching um, data flows and sensors to natural resource flows through systems, I think when you think about smart cities or smart technologies in buildings, increasingly the tracking and traceability using things like RFID technologies opens up huge new possibilities to rethink the linear nature uh, of business models. I like to use this um, slide, and if anyone wants any of these slides, they can ask Selena at the back, and, and we're happy to share them. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the metaphors uh, for me is that we're going to shift away from mining natural resources and mining the ground to mining waste and mining waste materials. And we're already seeing that to some extent. So if you look at what this chart showing you is, one ton of mobile phones, which I think I might have in my office alone, to be perfectly honest. I mean, the number of mobile phones we all pick up over the years. One ton of mobile phones versus one ton of gold ore mined from the ground. And then you look at the difference of the different metals alone. So copper... 50 to 150 kilograms versus 3.7 kilograms. Uh, silver, 500 to 700 grams versus 4.2 grams. And gold, and this is gold ore, remember, uh, 150 to 400 grams versus uh, 0.2 grams. Now, it's much cheaper to mine one ton of gold ore as we currently stand, so we need to be clear about that. But if you think about the untapped waste resource that sat somewhere being burnt or buried, you, know, you have to think that that is an enormous untapped potential when you see the kind of scarcity and volatility of resource inputs. But what we, what we need is the innovation and the new technologies and the scientific breakthroughs that allow us to make this economically viable. But you have to believe, I think, uh, that that is a, an equation that seems to open up new opportunities. I'm going to be a little bit conscious of time and not go through too much of the detail on this. But essentially, we believe that there is room for improvement to reuse and bring back into value chains. And there's a lot of research that sits behind this. I've had a team in India calculating numbers for the last sort of three or four months. We think... Um, and, and clearly you have to be very careful about the, the accuracy, which is why it says 60 to 90%. But we think that there are huge opportunities to reintegrate the value of materially, material currently being lost in the global economy back into circular economy models around the world. And we think that by... 2030 alone, as a reasonably conservative estimate, there's a $4 trillion global economy opportunity, global economic opportunity, uh, for this shift from linear to circular economy value principles. So that, I think, is the setup to the problem. That then leads us to the question on circular economy of what can be done and what solutions are scalable. And I'm not going to talk today about the macro level. I'm not going to talk about the systems level uh, for another conversation or for another, um, for another uh, summit. But what I want to talk about is what can be done at the micro level of businesses and companies uh, driving this into their strategies and into their capabilities. So... As I mentioned, at the core is this shift from linear to circular business models, from take, make, and waste to a world of circular value loops, of remanufacturing, reselling, reusing, repurposing, taking back, reprocessing, uh, right across different industries. A world which shifts from low return and recycling to closed and open loops, from waste and externalities to zero waste and value recapture, from selling volume to selling the performance of products and services, to managing resources in production to managing resources in markets, and decoupling growth tied to resource use to growth 
that reuses and recaptures value. And we believe that what we're seeing is five key business models uh, emerge that have proven to be resource light, have in certain cases shown to be what we would regard as entirely circular, but if not entirely circular, are showing directional movement that we believe has the potential in the future to become circular. And those five business models we see replicated across industries and across different business models. Very rarely do you see one company pursuing all five. Actually, what you find is an interesting blend being created by smart companies who understand ways and means in their specific industry or their specific geography to use the circular economy to disrupt the way we think about products and services or that we think about value chains. The first is circular supplies, uh, which is about providing renewable inputs, essentially. Bio-based or fully recyclable, so changing right at the, the point of procurement, the point of supply chains, thinking through very carefully how you replace resource inputs that are single life cycle uh, and replace them with circular life cycle. Resource recovery business models. So this is very much around how to get back those all-important materials at the end of life cycle. So you saw the example of mobile phones, for example, where you have to think about the take-back process. How do you create a value chain? How do you create the reverse logistics to make those kind of models viable? Product life extension, we're seeing increasingly companies designing their products <clears throat> not for short-term use, but elongating the useful life of their products. We're seeing that, for example, in the automotive sector where you think about how to shift from just selling a product, product with a one-off transaction to all of the services that you can provide for a longer period for a product that has been extended in terms of its useful life. Sharing platforms. Many of you will have seen around the world different platforms being set up to use resources more efficiently, whether or not, and I'll talk in a second about that, it's... Um, sharing in local communities or whether or not it's, for example, using some of the most important assets that we have globally as individuals, which tend to be our homes and tend to be our vehicles. They tend to be the largest capital expenditure for individuals around the world. So you things like, see things like Airbnb uh, that are allowing people to rent those uh, rooms out, rent those houses out more effectively, or you see ride sharing like Uber, uh, like Halo around the world, looking at how to make more efficient our transport systems and private vehicles. And then finally, products as a service. I think, for me, at least in the work I'm doing at the moment uh, with clients, I think products as a service is probably the most exciting I mean, that, everyone will have a different preference, I think, in terms of the models. But for me, products as a service is one of the most exciting. Because what products as a service is ultimately about is about um, moving away from the idea that you sell a simple product that it, and, and thinking how to disrupt the way we think about ownership to really rethinking the core purpose of a product thinking about the value that's embedded in it, thinking about the performance that that product offers to customers and consumers, and thinking about whether you can deliver that in a different way that requires you, in some cases, to own the product over its life cycle, to adapt it. A great example would be Amazon, you know, which is 
disrupted the entire uh, global market over the last 10, 15 years, um, not necessarily with sustainability in mind, but actually if you look at the shift towards the digital consumption of books, you know, they have a single device that is intended to last as long as you possibly can. Anyone who has an Amazon Kindle, it's the, probably the least attractive, least sexy device that you can imagine versus an Apple uh, iPhone 6 or whatever. But the idea is that's their platform to sell you books as a service over a long period of time. Um, and you see all the add-ons and all of the ways that you see them shifting from more traditional ways and means of distributing uh, and publishing books around the world. I think I've got a few minutes left, so I'll wrap up. What I think is important is that there are both great examples of disruptive, smaller startup players who are operating at the margins of markets, who are innovative and creative, who are actually coming up with new ways of thinking about value creation and new ways of thinking about the circular economy and growing quickly. You know, some of the examples I've put here, Ecovative in terms of its packaging material from agriculture waste, TerraCycle is an amazing example, now reaching 20 million customers around the world uh, to collect waste uh, for new products. And you can go right the way through the mud jeans. I have a pair of mud jeans that are, that are wonderful that actually are built on the principle of taking jeans back at the end of life cycle because denim uh, is highly reusable, recyclable. Uh, but also the real trick there with the products as a service with something like mud jeans is that it locks you into a customer relationship at the time when you want to give back your jeans, which is actually then the real trick because from a marketing and communication perspective, it creates a direct channel and relationship and loyalty uh, and a chance to influence the customer right at the time when you know that they're going to be at the point of purchase. So on the one hand, we have these new startups around the circular economy, but we also have big established companies around the world. Caterpillar, for example, who, as you probably know, they do actually make clothing as well, but that's not their main business. Their, their main business is making um, construction equipment, mining equipment, large-scale bulldozers, uh, and various heavily capital-intensive equipment for heavy industry around the world. They already have a business unit that is focused purely on circular economy, on reusing, recycling, repurposing, remanufacturing, all of those heavily capital intensive assets uh, and providing products as a service to a lot of their largest customers. That business unit now has 4,000 people uh, and has a $4 billion uh, profit and loss account just from managing these issues more effectively given the extraordinary value embedded in Caterpillar's uh, products. And so, you know, I mentioned Airbnb. Airbnb is a sharing platform, very, very interesting model. Uh, now, I believe, I have to look at today's um, figures in terms of the stock market, but Airbnb, not only is it the fastest growing provider of hotel rooms or accommodation in the world, but its market capitalization is now bigger than the Hilton hotel chain. So we're seeing that the markets are picking up increasingly on these different ways and means of creating value, of unlocking value from existing assets like people's homes, like people's vehicles, right around the world. Let me finish by saying, as I said at the beginning, this is not going to be a short journey. There are significant shifts in capabilities that are required. I've put up a few that underpin some of the changes that we've seen taking place in some of the five business models and the companies I've mentioned. But for example, at the level of strategy, shifting from the kinds of models, linear models we have now to managing complex ecosystems of partners is almost a given in a world of the circular economy. Innovation and development that means designing from single use to designing for many life cycles and users. Sourcing and manufacturing from simple homogenous supply chains to often quite complex supply chains that are going to source materials from places 
that you might never have thought before that are currently bottlenecks for reuse and value uh, in, uh, in the, the linear model. Sales and product use, as I mentioned, shifting towards building longer-term relationships with customers and consumers because you're not simply going to be in a single transaction at a single point in time. You're going to be looking to build that relationship over several life cycles of the product or service. And, of course, return chains because you need your product and service back at the end of life cycle. So, three questions to finish that I think it's important for companies to be thinking about to join that shift towards circular advantage. One, what is going to be the most important change driver for your organization and in what segments and markets? So, is it going to be the price of a particularly important input, a particularly important commodity, energy price, water price, a metal that's embedded in your products and service, or is it going to be a shift in terms of the patterns of consumers or customers, or is it going to be a regulatory change? What is going to be the transformational driver that's going to force that shift or create the opportunity? <coughs> Secondly, what are the most relevant circular economy business models for you? If you look at those five, how could you deploy those models? How could you actually create advantage and disruption in your industry or in your market? And then thirdly, how advanced are you on that journey to securing technology leadership to decouple growth from resource use? So put very simply, the main driver, the main business model, and the main technologies. And that's a good place, I think, for organizations to start. So thank you very much. I hope that's been a useful introduction to the circular economy and what we're seeing in terms of disruption, but also an enormous opportunity. And as you can see, one that is already starting to capture the imagination of executives here in China, and I think has huge potential, uh, not just in China, but across Asia and the world, um, to create a very different and sustainable model of economic growth at a global level. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I, I feel so guilty that I give you so little time. And it's such an exciting topic with vast richness in it to uh, help us to think about circular economy and business model. I, I'm sure that uh, during coffee break you'll be surrounded by many people. And, uh, Peter has given us a very interesting topic. Actually, for the operation and development of enterprises, it's a very important topic. It's about circular economy, which has been popular for quite a few years. So how do we utilize circular economy in, in sustainability, and what is the future trend? Actually, in Peter's presentation, he has given us a very um, streamlined interpretation. So from his presentation, we can see globally so it has a total economic value of four trillion US dollars. So that is very encouraging. And Peter has also listed five major business models for circular economy. One of the major important thing is that Peter has asked us three questions. I think for these three questions, well, enterprises are transforming to circular economy. You have to figure out these three questions. Only when you are ready to answer those three questions, you will be able to create values and efficiency. So we have about five minutes to open to the floor for questions to Peter so you can raise your hands. So in the third row. Okay, Peter, good morning. My name is Mali Bo. I'm from a Chinese local company. I'm a CS director. Actually, you have mentioned that circular economy uh, enterprise has a very bright future, but for me right now, a lot of private Chinese enterprises are also in, in the process of transformation, which is very painful. And as a CSR practitioner, so we need to do something. Do you have any suggestions for me? 
that said, so let me just clarify the question. You, you mean that um, get, when you say that it's been a very challenging situation for a lot of Chinese local companies, what, what could you give an example of some of the challenges? Uh, for example, for Chinese local companies, they are still pursuing for higher competitiveness, lower costs, higher efficiency, and maximum profits. So as a CSR director, so we need to let the owner understand the future trend of CSR, but there will be cost attached to that, right? So uh, I think that that uh, is a great point, and it's certainly true here in, in China. I see that um, all the time, that, that there are um, significant um, competitiveness pressures more in the traditional sense, I think, in the market, there's no doubt. Uh, I think the, your specific question is about what would my advice be. I think as, a, as someone leading you know, a corporate responsibility or a sustainability division, I think the key for me is to link the efforts that you are investing in, the uh, kinds of initiatives that you are promoting to the core business strategy. Right? My view is that sustainability or corporate responsibility done well is a lens for value creation in the sense that it can be about helping to understand market trends and opportunities for new products and new services and new markets, whether it's in clean energy or circular economy or whatever. Whether or not it is helping to manage more effectively your asset base, so buildings or vehicles or whatever, so to be able to be more efficient, which actually drives cost out of the business. Um, or whether or not it is in being able to improve the quality of relationships with suppliers or employees or others, you know, which might be more around the reputation and the stakeholder management side of things. And my experience is that um, private entrepreneurs uh, and, and smaller businesses in China, when you start talking their language and you start showing them how you're going to invest, and not every initiative is going to be closely impacted or you know, closely linked to the, um, the economic return, and neither does it need to be. But I think when you start talking their language and show them how you, they can improve their relationships and why that's good for their business over a short and long period of time, that tends to be more effective. And, and in particular, not investing across the spectrum of 50 or 60 things, but working out the two or three main things that really reinforce the positioning of that business. Is it, is it a low-cost player? Is it a premium brand? Is it you know, finding ways and means for CSR to link directly and reinforce the competitive positioning of that business? I, I find that Chinese entrepreneurs are very open to, 